and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's continue to worship in song. Um, you're welcome to stand if you would like and we will worship.
children are now welcome to come up uh, with Susan to decorate the cross.
to continue in your worship through giving. Um, if you're visiting today, um, feel free to just pass along the offering to the next person.
Well, good morning again. My name is Jason, and I wanted to welcome you to Granville Chapel once again. So uh, that, was a, that was a wonderful symbolism, wasn't it, with the decoration on the cross? Uh, the cross symbolizing death, but the flowers symbolizing new life. So very appropriate at this time of Easter Sunday. Um, at, uh, at Granville Chapel, we are a church that loves to connect, and I do want to draw your attention to the connect cards. So if you are joining us for the first time, we would love to get to know you, uh, know how to support you, know how to pray for you. So feel free to fill out one of these connect cards and drop it off uh, in the appropriate box in the lobby area, and then somebody uh, will be in touch with you. Um, and I have a couple of announcements to make this morning. Um, the first one is the community potluck that will be happening on April 14th. So uh, we want to invite you to come and enjoy some food and conversations with us following the service on April 14th. Uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, we do ask that you sign up for the potluck online via the church app, or you can go to granvillechapel.com slash events. And then second announcement, uh, we have a membership event happening on Wednesday, April 3rd at 7.30 p.m. Uh, so join us for dessert in the fireside area over here uh, to find out more about membership and what it means to be part of the Granville Chapel community. So please RSVP by March 31st, which is today. So appreciate that so that we know how much dessert uh, to bring for the event. And now I will invite uh, Max and Caitlin up uh, to uh, talk about the sunrise baptism service that happened this morning. Good morning, everyone. So this morning, uh, we woke up before the sun came up to run to, not run, we didn't actually run there, to get to uh, Spanish Banks or Locarno Beach for Caitlin's baptism. Um, so Caitlin, yeah, let's celebrate. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Woo! Sweet. Uh, and it was a beautiful morning, very chilly, but the sun was just rising, and at the moment she came out of the water, it was like a movie scene, the sun shone right on her face. Um, and she came into new life with Jesus. So it's super exciting. Caitlin's just going to share a quick word uh, with you all that she wanted to share. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say, after getting baptized this morning at sunrise, that I'm grateful for you supporting me in the last year as I've come back to Granville, and I'm so excited to walk into a new life with Jesus alongside all of you. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, Caitlin. Do we have a video? Do we have a video? Oh, and we have a video, so you guys can join us when on the beach. When I was in grade nine, I was in a car accident, which took some time to recover from physically, but I struggled mentally for a long time. That spring, I began going to youth group. Um, during the summer, I completed a leadership program. That summer was full of spiritual growth and learning. Joshua 1.9 reads, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But through this journey, the only thing that matters and the reason I want to get baptized today is because of Jesus and my love for him. Because I know that Jesus loves me so much and wants to have a relationship with me. And I just wanted to share this with everyone and share his love too. Thank you. Okay, you ready? Yeah. <laughs>
All right, thank you so much, Max. Congratulations, Caitlin, and uh, thank you also to the team who put the video together. That was wonderful to see. Uh, so now we'll move on to our Connect time. Um, so I'll invite the Kingdom Kids out to their programs, uh, and we have two minutes to connect. Um, try to talk to somebody that you haven't been uh, talking to recently, and um, I'll come back after the two minutes are done. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I love hearing all these vibrant conversations happening. It's so wonderful to see. Um, yeah, and I would invite you to continue these conversations uh, afterwards in the fireside area. So um, just, just for people to know, we will be serving coffee after service in the fireside area for you to continue those conversations. Um, and now we have Matt here for the scripture reading. Good. Well, Jesus is risen. And we get to read about the first people who discovered that from John chapter 20. All right, I'll get going here. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am sending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand out, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, team. Thanks, all the helpers. Uh, What a wonderful, wonderful celebration and worship we have this morning as we celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful service this morning uh, at Locarno Beach where, like as Max described, after she went down into the water, she came out and literally the sun's rays just shone on her, the first rays over the horizon. It was just beautiful. It was beautiful. Um, yeah, my name's Sam. I'm one of the pastors here, and I get to share God's Word with us this morning. So let me pray as we get started. Father, we give you thanks for the resurrection of your Son, Jesus. And sometimes we can't quite comprehend or fathom what that means. But we are so thankful, and we praise you, and we worship you for this fact of history, that he was raised bodily from the dead and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. I don't know what that means, Lord, but I know it means victory, and it means life. It means that I'm invited into this wonderful story and that the promises of old have now been fulfilled in Jesus and now continuing to be fulfilled in those who believe in him. Lord, as we turn to this story and turn to your word, would you enliven our hearts once more to hear the truths that we are about to hear and to receive them anew. In Christ's powerful name we pray, amen. Imagine with me Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, that final scene, that final battle, the climactic battle. The evil forces of Mordor are gathered around the city capital city of Gondor. They're sieging, laying siege to that city. 
And this is the last fortress of humankind. Men and women have been fighting valiantly, but they are seriously outnumbered, and they are losing this battle. Things look very bleak. But the story is not over, because there are many strands to the story of the Lord of the Rings, and one of them has to do with the neighboring country, Rohan. And so, as this battle continues, Gandalf, along with King Theoden, comes with an army from Rohan and onto the scene and come to the aid of Gondor. And the scene begins to shift. The tone of the battle begins to shift. The tide begins to turn. Then Princess Warrior Eowyn defeats the Dark Rider, and the tide shifts even more. But that's not all. Because then King Aragorn, from the ancient line of the kings of Gondor, arrives at the 11th hour, leading an entire army from the realm of the dead. And together, these armies, together, push back, drive back the forces of evil. And there is this decisive victory for humankind, for good over evil. It's the climax of the story of the Lord of the Rings. And what makes this moment so powerful is that there are all these pieces, all these different storylines interwoven together, all these different characters from the very beginning of the first story, the first book, journeying together, sometimes journeying apart, but coming together in climax on that battlefield, securing victory, securing life for humankind. That's the climax of the Lord of the Rings. Well, today, Resurrection Sunday, is something like that for us. We've been hearing about and learning about the good news ever since January. Well, ever since before. I mean, ever since you knew Jesus, right? But we've been focusing on that in this series ever since January. Learning about what is the good news. Well, everything that the good news of Jesus is points towards today. In fact, the whole Bible climaxes on this day. All the different storylines, all the motifs and themes of the Old Testament point towards today. Converge on this one point, this day that the church calls Easter. Today is that climax. Now, in our series on the good news of Jesus, we've been learning that the good news, the gospel of Jesus, is the climax of the whole Bible. Well, the climax of that climax is the resurrection of Jesus. What are the key components of that good news? We've talked about, they center on three facts. The death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the exaltation of Jesus to heaven. And what's the central claim of these facts together? The sweet spot, the power of this message, it is that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is King. He's Lord over this entire world, over our lives. And today, of all days in the church year, we can understand and appreciate that message the most. From the vantage point of Easter, Easter Sunday morning, we look back and everything makes sense. The whole story now makes sense. This is the gospel message. He's no longer hanging on a, on a cross. He's no longer dead in a tomb. He's alive. He's risen. He's ascended to the Father. He is Lord over this universe, and he wants to be Lord over our lives. Today, I want to think a bit more about this climax from the perspective of the Gospel of John and why it is such good news for us. So I want to look especially at the end of the passage that Matt has read out to us. The last two verses of our reading today, and I want to use this as a launching point of what we're going to be talking about. I'll look at different parts of the Gospel of John, especially from chapters 13 all the way to chapters 17, what we call the farewell discourse 
But I want to use these two verses as a launching point for that discussion. So let me read them out again. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So here's my outline for the rest of uh, our next several moments together. First, I want to talk about eternal life and the kingdom, or life, as John simply puts it here in this uh, last verse, life and the kingdom of God, and what that, how that relates together. Second, I want to talk specifically about three gifts that this eternal life represents, three gifts from the king that he wants to give to us, his followers. And third, I want to talk about how. How do we receive these gifts, these three gifts that the king wants to give us? Okay? So eternal life and the kingdom. So let's start there. Eternal life. Well, in the Gospel of John, eternal life is really equated with life. John uses these terms almost interchangeably. So sometimes he uses the word eternal life, and then the next phrase, he'll talk about life. Sometimes he'll talk about life. Then the very next sentence, he'll talk about eternal life. So I'll give you an example of this. John chapter 5, verses 44. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. He is passed from death to life. He is passed from death to life. You notice that he has eternal life. Not he will have eternal life. He has passed from death to life. Not he will pass from death to life. It's in the present tense. For John, eternal life is not just about what happens after we die, but it's about something that is happening now, something that's happening now in the present time, present tense. In fact, the concept of eternal for the Jewish mind was different than the concept of eternal for the Greek mind. And the Jewish mind is really what we're trying to understand because The Old Testament is encapsulated in the Jewish culture and Jewish form. See, in the Greek mind, there was this split between the mind and the spirit and the body. And so it was thought that the spirit really was imprisoned by the body. It was a spirit which was a pure form, the eternal form, the everlasting form. The body was corrupt, it was temporal, and eternity would be spent in disembodied spirit form because that is what is eternal. Not so the Jewish understanding and worldview. The Jewish worldview was much more unified. Spirit and body were held together. And so for the Jewish person, the word eternity and eternal life actually has more to do with the age to come. See, for the Jewish person in the first century in the ancient world, history was divided into two ages, two eons. The first was a present age, and that was the age of promise, that God had promised to his people to be present with them. He would promised to reign over them, but he, his reign was not complete. His reign had not been fulfilled in this age. But there was an age to come in which his reign, his kingdom, would be fulfilled. And that's different from this present age. And what separates the two is his coming, is the kingdom coming into this age. And so the kingdom of God, really, the eternal age to come, or eternity, was not so much about leaving this world as much as it was about fixing this world. His justice, his peace would be restored, first of all, to his people, Israel, but through them to all the nations, so to the whole world. It wasn't just about leaving this world. It was really about restoring this world, repairing this world. A way to think about it is that It's not so much about the quantity, but about the quality. Or maybe it's just as much about the quality 
as it is the quantity of life that eternal life refers to. You with me? Okay. Second point. I want to talk about this quality of life a little bit and uh, tease it out some more for, from the perspective of the Gospel of John. So there are three gifts I mentioned, three gifts that the king wants to give us as his followers. They are peace, joy, and love. Of course, there are more things that the Lord wants to give us, but especially from the Gospel of John, especially in these chapters from 13 on through to 17, just before the crucifixion, what we call the farewell discourse, he talks about peace, joy, and love in this very intimate time of teaching that he has with his disciples. And we're going to look, about, look at that, think about these a little bit more, peace, joy, and love. So let's start with peace. The narrative of John goes like this. In chapters 13 to 17, he's now turned away from the public and to this private ministry, this intimate time that he has with his disciples. There's this long description of the hours leading up to Jesus' death, five chapters worth. And Jesus is about to be crucified, and he's praying in the garden, and he says... Chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I'll read that out again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is one of my favorite portions of Scripture, chapters 13 to 17, because what it shows, Jesus' character is on a full display while he's under pressure, under tremendous pressure. And what comes forth, what's displayed, is his true inner character. And notice what Jesus says about these gifts that he wants to, dip, to, to, um, to give to his disciples. He says, not as the world gives do I give to you. It's something out of this world. It's something that this world cannot give to us. It's something that's qualitatively different than the peace, the joy, the love that we experience from this world. I have an example, an illustration, a kind of a story for you. It's kind of fun. Um, I remember when one of my sons started playing hockey. This is the early years when they were very young, and this is my first year uh, as an assistant coach. And uh, I was on the ice with all the other dads as assistant coaches. We're just volunteers, right? I mean, we have some hockey experience, some of us more so than others. And I remember one of the dads, he was like uh, taller than us, uh, bigger than us, and I watched him skate. He was so smooth. His, skates were, his, his strides were so powerful and so strong. And then when he handled the puck, it was so natural. It was like, wow. And then I was talking to another dad. I go, oh, that guy's really good. He goes, yeah. That's uh, Kevin Bieksa from the Vancouver Canucks. <laughs> so his son was on the same team, and he was just one of the volunteers. He wasn't the head coach or anything. He was just kind of skating around, not under any pressure. But he's, he's just kind of... Next, you could tell just by the way he skated, in balance, everything, right? I'm just talking about, imagine if he had said to me, Sam, my stride, I give to you. <laughs> my stick handling, I give to you. My balance, I give to you. And not like these other dads. <laughs> That's what I want to give to you. This is what we're talking about. A different level of peace of joy, of love. It's kind of a silly illustration, but I think you understand what I'm saying. What Jesus experiences, what Jesus possesses, his peace, his joy, his love, that's what he wants to give to us. Something from the next age breaking into, seeping into this age. Eternal qualities seeping into this age. We live in a world, don't we, which is broken. We know that. We experience that on a daily basis. Things are not as they ought to be. I mean, the clearest example of that is the story that we have just experienced through this weekend. The most wonderful human being who was ever born 
Jesus of Nazareth, his own people totally misunderstood him. Things are not as they ought to be in this world. His own friends, his closest friends, betrayed him and abandoned him at his most needful hour. Somehow, this human being in history, he suffers, he's mocked, he's ridiculed, he's crucified, he's killed. The most shameful way possible in the ancient world, on a cross, that kind of thing is not supposed to happen, but it does in this world. It does. Things are not as they ought to be. And yet, Jesus had what? Peace. He said, my peace I give to you. So as, again, like in these hours leading up to his death, I mean, his, his disciples, and another gospel says, are sleeping, he's praying, so much so that he's dropping sweats of blood. He's sweating drops of blood. And that he has a presence of mind to comfort his disciples and to say, my peace I give to you. I know I need that kind of peace. I need that kind of peace. Because I'm the kind of person where I get stressed out about even the little things. I remember when I was going to university and there'd be an exam the next day. I couldn't sleep because I'd be studying, studying, and I'd be so worried. I know that when I'm driving along the street, someone cuts me off in traffic. I get upset, right? I lose my sense of peace. But not so Jesus, right? I think we all need this kind of peace, which is from beyond us, outside us, from another world, from another age, eternity to break into our lives, and our hearts. Peace. Second, joy. Joy. Jesus also wants to give us joy. So chapter 15 now, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, peace in the midst of a broken world, I get that, but joy in the midst of suffering that's almost, again, next level, right? I, I imagine that this is what separates the saints from the ordinary people. Joy, joy in the midst of suffering. And yet this is a very, very common strand in the New Testament. Not just John, Paul, James, Peter, all of the New Testament, in fact, points to this, that we are to experience joy in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering. Why? I think there are some clues here in the text that we can kind of unpack and unfold. And I'll read some of the context of chapter 15, verse 11. Here's the context. A couple of verses before 15, 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. What's the connection here? What's the source of Jesus' joy in the midst of pain and suffering? The Father. He's doing the Father's will. He knows he's doing the Father's will. He's in this relationship of love with the Father. And that, therefore, is his source of joy, even in the midst of suffering. He knows that that is somehow, in God's greater plan, part of the overall plan of the universe, that he suffers and dies. And so that even in that suffering and pain and death, his relationship with the Father gives him joy. And I think it works the same way for us, in a smaller scale, of course. How do we experience joy and suffering? Partly, I think it's because when we're doing what Jesus has asked us to do, when we're loving in the way Jesus has asked us and commanded us to love, when we're suffering in the way he wants us to suffer, not for the sake of suffering, but for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of his purposes, for the sake of his plan, in the greater scheme of things, when we're taking on the same suffering that he would, 
that brings us closer to the master, makes us more like him, and therefore becomes a source of joy for us. We're walking with the master. His presence gives us joy. Who he is brings us joy. We're growing more and more like Jesus. Okay, finally, thirdly, love. And here I think we're getting pretty close to something quite universal in um, just human existence, whether you're religious or not or Christian or not. We all, I think, sense that love is very deeply part of our human reality, and it should be. A couple examples from the movies. Um, how many of you watch the, the, it's an older movie, Interstellar, that movie, Interstellar? Some of you? Okay, well, for the rest of you, I'll, I'll kind of spoil it for you. Um, so it's a sci-fi movie. Main character, Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey, he falls into this black hole, this uh, what is called a tesseract. And it's, it's like a wormhole that is, you know, space and time and gravity are all kind of related. And so he travels back in time. And he's able to actually communicate with his daughter. But why did he fall into this tesseract? Why did he fall into this wormhole? Well, he was on this journey to actually help save the planet because of what uh, humankind had done to the, the environment. And in order to do that, he had to travel light years away from the planet in order to help save the planet. So... As he's traveling, he doesn't age because of space and time and how that works, but his daughter, whom he left as a very young child, has now grown up, has missed, her, her, missed him growing up, and she's now a grown adult. But why was he allowed? Why did these fifth-dimensional beings create this wormhole, this tesseract, for him to fall into? He re reveals at the very end of the movie, he says, love so that he could come back and communicate with his daughter that he had not forsaken her, had not abandoned her, but this was his mission. So love was a purpose. Here's another example from the movies. Even older, um, so you'll know how old I am. I was uh, a young adult watching The Matrix uh, in the movie theaters. And so again, how many have seen that? Okay, more of you. So if you haven't, I'm going to ruin it for you, spoil it for you even more. But um, so the final scene of the first movie, Matrix, Neo, he's injured, he's been shot, he's died. He's dead now. He's laying on the floor, dying. Well, not quite. Because what happens is another main character, Trinity, says, no, Neo, you can't die. You cannot die because the prophecy has said, I will fall in love with the one. I will fall in love with the one. And Neo, you cannot die because you are the one. And then she kisses him and he comes back to life. <laughs> he is the one. And I remember walking out of that movie theater thinking, Wow, this writer just ruined a perfectly good sci-fi movie by making it all about romantic love. <laughs> but I think there is a kind of a truth to this. When we're talking about ultimate things, about death, life, reality, how can we not talk about love? Love. And so Jesus says, my love I give to you. Right? Parental love between a father, daughter, Romantic love between a man and a woman. Love, friendship uh, among friends. Love among a community. My love I give to you. The problem with the world's kind of love, though, the world's kind of joy, the world's kind of peace, is that it's fickle, isn't it? It's natural human love to love someone who is lovable, but when things get tough, not so easy to love. When things get hard, when you get annoyed, when you don't have time, it's not that easy to love anymore. Our love is kind of a selfish kind of a love, but not so the Father's love, not so Jesus' love. 
when things got hard and challenging and painful, Jesus' love got stronger and clearer and purer. I mean, it's in these chapters, 13 to 17 and on through to 20, that we see this. The first verse of chapter 13 begins like this. When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that is the hour of his betrayal and his death, his hour to, had come to depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. So when things get tough for Jesus, his love doesn't get weaker like ours does. His gets stronger. That's the kind of love that God has. That's the kind of love that Jesus wants to impart to us. This is one of the gifts that he wants to give to us. This is the eternal life that he wants to break into our lives from the age to come now into this age, into the present time. Peace, joy, and love. Now, one last thing I want to do, um, talk about is how. how. How do we get this? How do we receive these gifts from the king who wants to give it to us? I haven't talked about that yet. How do we get this life of the age to come, eternal life today? Well, again, we look at the text and we hear. What does it say? But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. These are written. What, what's these things that he's written? What's he talking about, John? He's talking about the signs, the signs that the Gospel of John is all about. He's selected seven of them, the perfect number, symbolic number. It's not all the signs that Jesus did, but there's a symbolic representative number of the signs that he did perform while he was alive among them. If you see these signs, you hear about these signs, and you believe, you will have life in his name. Life, remember, eternal life and life is the same thing. But there are two kinds of belief in the New Testament. One is an intellectual assent. One is saying, yes, I believe this is true. It really, truly happened. This was not just a figment of someone's imagination. He didn't just create this, write about this as if it were a story, a fiction, but this actually happened in real history, in this world in which we live. It's true. That's one kind of belief. And that, that is what John is partly wanting. He wants us to realize that these things that he's written about are true, are in fact part of reality and part of history that we experience as human beings. It's not just make up and make believe. But there's another dimension of belief here that the New Testament and the Gospel of John is after. And that is that belief is not just intellectual. It's not just assenting that that is true, but is realizing that this truth has an impact on my belief system, on who I want to be and how I live. That's the other kind of belief in the New Testament. And the second kind of belief has to do with loyalty, it has to do with commitment, it has to do with obedience. That's also what belief refers to. And so if you read chapters 13 to 20, there is this refrain that comes up again and again. Obedience. My commandments. Love as I have loved you. Obey my commandments as I have obeyed the Father's commandments. That's how closely tied obedience and faith are. But there's even a more basic clue here in this verse. What is it that we are to believe? What are we to believe? That Jesus is what? He's Lord. See, you can believe that Jesus existed. 
You can believe and believe that Jesus died. You can even believe that he rose again and not be changed. You can believe that those facts are facts of history and not be changed. But you cannot say those words, Jesus is Lord, and not be changed. Because Jesus as Lord is not just a fact of history, but it means some kind of posture that you are giving and that you are offering to this Lord. Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is the Lord. You cannot say that without being changed. That's the kind of belief that John is after ultimately, that you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And as you do that, you will receive these gifts. And we haven't talked about the Holy Spirit, but it's the Spirit who imparts these gifts to us. In another place in Scripture, it says, you cannot even say those words apart from the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit empowering you to believe and to trust. And so as you believe and you trust, then he imparts these gifts of peace and joy and love to us. So I want to invite us all to do that today, maybe for the first time and maybe for the thousandth time. And I think if you are a believer, you won't tire ever of doing this, of professing that Jesus is Lord. It's kind of like singing the national anthem or pledging allegiance to the flag, which things which we often don't do anymore, but it's what you aspire to be, what you aspire to do every day, every moment. You want Jesus to be Lord. And so if it's your first time, I invite you to bring your heart to the Lord in this posture. If it's not the first time, I invite you to bring your heart to the Lord in this posture. So I'm going to pray for us and invite you to take any posture that you want that reflects your heart. And so if that means kneeling, putting the chairs down and just kneeling, do that. I encourage you. Let your body also reflect your heart. But I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer now. Father, we give you thanks for the truth of Easter Sunday, the truth that Jesus is indeed risen, the grave could not hold him. Death could not hold him. He defeated sin and is victorious. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. It is not just a truth that is removed from us, but is a truth that directly relates to us. And so we want to submit our lives to you. We want to be obedient to you. We want to receive this truth in faith that you are Lord, not just over the world, but over our lives. So Lord, help us. Show us in our lives where we resist your kingship and your lordship. Lord, if, if there are people here who are wrestling with this truth, I pray that you'll give them the grace and the power to receive this truth and to give their lives to you and receive in faith all that you want to give them. Yes, forgiveness of sin, but so much more. Life, eternal life. Peace, joy, and love like this world does not know. Lord, help us exhibit these, these, these traits just as your son Jesus did. Help us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, on Easter Sunday, we also get to take the communion. And so it's a wonderful honor and privilege that we get to share in this symbolic meal together. And not just with words, but also with our bodies, with actions, what he did for us. And remember, we remember that the path to kingship for Jesus, it was not devoid of pain and suffering. In fact, it necessitated pain and suffering and death. And so that also is part of what he invites us into. It's a kingship that empties himself even to the point of death on a cross. And he gives 
us to the power to live in the same kind of way, with that same kind of peace and joy and love that he had, even in the face of suffering. And so as we come and take of the table today, I would encourage you to be reminded, yes, of all that he's done for you, but also to let the bread and the cup be a sign of your allegiance to him, a sign of your loyalty to him, of your obedience, of what you want to give back to him. So as you're taking, ask yourself, where is it that I need to obey more? Where is it that he wants to be more and more real in my life? Where are those places that I want to surrender more and more to the Lord? In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it for all to eat, saying, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At Granville Chapel, we celebrate an open table. So to all who believe in Jesus, we invite you to come and receive of this bread and of this cup and to be nourished in it. And if you believe in him, you've committed your life to him, we invite you to come and receive If you haven't yet taken that step of faith, but you want to, we invite you to come and receive as a first sign of your obedience and of your faith, of your belief in him. You're invited to do so as well. Um, Just a few instructions as we get started. Um, If you're not able somehow to make it to the front, we ask that you can raise your hand and the servers will come after everyone else has been served and will serve you. Um, We will also uh, have the ushers come. I'll say a prayer for us and invite the the ushers to come forward at this time and then we'll serve the worship team and we'll go from the aisles to the front and then uh, down the center aisle to back to your seat again. I invite you to stand as we pray. Father, thank you for these gifts of the bread and of the cup, symbols of your body and your blood given for us. As we take of these elements, would you remind us of Jesus' peace and of his joy and of his love? And would you give to us the same peace and joy and love by his spirit and by his power? Help us to follow him with a loyalty and the faithfulness that he deserves. Amen. seated, invite you to come, all is ready.
There's a God who weeps. There's a God who pleads. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Oh, hallelujah to the Son of suffering. of the prayer ministry team to come forward. Um, if you would like to receive prayer um, in a petition or a praise, um, our, our prayer ministry volunteers would be happy to pray with you. Drenched in tears, they laid him down. 
chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may these words that we have sung not just be sung from our lips, but also from our hearts and from our lives, with our bodies, in response to him. And in the measure that you acknowledge him as your Lord, in obedience and loyalty and faithfulness. May he give to you peace, joy, and love, not as the world gives, but in the way that he gives. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.